Hello friends, welcome back to Tech with Viresh. So in the continuation to our series on understanding Apache Spark 3, interesting facts about Spark 3 and the available uh, set of new features, today in this particular video we'll talk about one of the marquee features of Spark 3 which is Delta Lake. So I'm sure you must have heard about this new concept of a Delta Lake. It's quite a buzzword and quite a path-breaking from the perspective that it kind of adds that flavor of you know uh, existing databases and data warehouses onto this uh, space of big data in memory compute of spark so guys we'll try to understand in this video what exactly is the delta lake we'll run through uh, the different features of the delta lake with a demo and also we'll try to understand how this particular la layer of delta lake fits into the existing landscape of a Spark along with the different uh, components that Spark plugs in and helps in building the entire big data compute data processing solution. So guys, before I proceed, I would like to request to all of my viewers to please share, comment, like on the videos and also do not, for do not forget to subscribe to the channel. So okay guys, so let's start. Uh, so this is the uh, component architecture of the Spark. So primarily we have this Spark Compute Run Engine. So at the core of this entire technology, we have Spark as the run runtime engine, which helps in processing uh, the data with the in-memory compute. And on top of that, we have set of different APIs like Spark Core, which is available in uh, different languages with your Scala, PySpark, etc. And then additional components of Spark SQL, Streaming, Mlib, and Graphics. But Spark doesn't provide any of its own cluster manager uh, solution. So it kinds of plug in with the third party components for cluster management solutions like Yarn, Mesos, or Kubernetes. At the same time, Spark doesn't provide any sort of uh, storage solution from, from itself. So for that, it can plug in with uh, Hadoop HDFS, Amazon S3, or Azure Blob. At the same time, to do the entire metadata management, Spark relies on Hive at the as the Metastore uh, solution. So what happens with this? When you integrate Spark with these third-party components, uh, it all depends upon what is the flavor of these components in itself. For example, if you talk about the consistency of the HDFS or any of these data lake kind of solutions, they are eventually consistent. So that doesn't give you an, uh, a, an absolute consistency as it would be available, say, in a database or in a data warehouse world. So uh, and at the same time, when you are relying on the external cluster managers, it, it doesn't help you to achieve the atomicity or to apply the asset properties on the entire transaction when Spark tries to read and write with the uh, with these uh, distributed storage solutions. So to kind of fill in this particular gap, what we have available as a solution in Spark 3 is the Delta Lake. So Delta Lake is a reliable storage solution which kinds of beautifully slips between the Spark runtime and these external components of uh, cluster manager or distributed storage and supplement these additional features uh, which are fully compatible with the Spark APIs. Your features like SE transactions, you know, uh, handling of the byte scale or uh, petabyte scales of metadata, lot of DML support, etc. So if we try to understand the Delta Lake from the manifestation perspective, it's an open source storage layer that kind of brings in that reliability onto your read and write transactions with the external distributed storages. At the same time, the Delta Lake beautifully uh, sits on top of your existing data lakes, your HDFS, S3s, blobs, etc. And it's absolutely compatible with the existing Spark APIs. So now with the Spark 3, the APIs which are available at the core SQL uh, and other components are fully compatible with uh, the Delta Lake solution and fills in that gap and provides your additional such set of features to leverage that flavor of uh, reliability. 
uh, even if you try to look at the component architecture or the landscape architecture of the databricks which is one of the most common used uh, spark runtime onto the cloud as the pass offerings so this is the existing uh, landscape that you see right you have the lowest layer in terms of in terms of cloud and then you have this databricks runtime uh, which is built on top of your native spark and gives you additional libraries <coughs> and on top of that you have the uh, developer utilities notebooks you know uh, creation of uh, jobs apis etc so in this landscape also data lake kind of sits in between this databricks runtime and the underlying pass providers uh, which provides you the facilities for distributed storages and resource manager so the concept remains same for Delta Lake, it kind of bridges that g gap between the runtime and the third party components of distributed storages, resource management, metadata management, etc. So, if we try to look at uh, the feature set which are provided uh, as part of the Spark 3 Delta Lake, is this is the list of uh, the different features you have asset transactions on Spark, metadata handling, unification of the batch and streaming APIs schema enforcement and out of these the some of the top major uh, features uh, of spark delta lake are it provides the absolutely asset transactions onto your spark with the external uh, distributed storage systems provides you a comprehensive support for for dml things like delete update merge upsets etc we we'll look into uh, how to leverage all those apis it provides a comprehensive support for schema and for uh, schema enforcement at the ingestion or at the at the right time itself which obviously is the correct time to check for the schema rather than depending on the schema on read uh, paradigm <coughs> and then it also provides you a support for time travel where you can look at the uh, snapshot of the data at different uh, timestamps at different times how the data is uh, kind of populated at different time intervals so let's try to run a demo and see how uh, this spark delta lake bridges that or bring that asset transaction flavor onto the spark for that let's try to understand it uh, uh, let's try to understand it that what are the shortcomings do we have in the existing uh, versions of spark why they're not asset because as per the documentation there is some level of uh, uh, acid or atomicity of the transaction is maintained but as soon as if there is any sort of runtime exception that kind of breaks let's try to run it with the existing spark version let's jump on to the spark shell and uh, we'll try to run this particular this particular uh, demo code so what we are, what I'm essentially trying to do here is I've created a sim simple CSV file as part of this command. I've created a data frame and I'm trying to write it as a CSV file on to my Spark. And then what I try to do is I try to uh, populate or overwrite the same location with say a newer transaction where I'm trying to write in say another 50 records on top of that. And then we threw a runtime exception in between. So if uh, the asset property of the transaction is maintained then probably my data the existing data state should not be messed up and my data should remain that uh, that hundred integer values that we have created as as part of the first command as part of the first job but let's see what happens in the existing version of the spark let's go to uh, let's go to the shell this is the command let's try to create the data first so it's it's a simple command to create uh, integer values a csv file with integer values from 1 to 100 right okay let me try to start the shell let me try to st start the shell So the current version of the Spark that I'm using for this particular demo is Spark 2.4. 
uh, the version that we have is Spark 2.4.6 and let's try to create that uh, that CSV file right so we are trying to create this CSV file with integer values 1 to 100 with this command so it's created let's uh, look at the data so so we have this part file which created for the CSV right now let's try to execute the program this program where, where we're trying to explicitly throw the runtime exception in the middle of the transaction where we are trying to overwrite this particular data location and let's see what happens let's go to the spark shell Let's try to run it. It should throw the runtime exception. So it has thrown the runtime exception. Yes, it has the exception that we have thrown. And let's see what happened to the state of the data that we had. So if you see here, there is no data at all. And the reason for that is, if we look at the this particular program, what we are trying to do is we are trying to override, override that data. <coughs> and the constructor of the override is such that that it, it will first delete that particular directory or that particular location and then try to populate the data into it but as we got the runtime exception in between that data is never been able to load it and my transaction was not been able to roll back because the transaction was not at all acid there were no this transaction was not atomic so uh, the spark was not able to roll it back and maintain the previous state of the data which is which is pretty bad which is pretty dangerous if you're trying to write uh, or as part of our uh, any specific job we are trying to write the data so this is what the shortcoming we have seen in the current version 2.4 of the spark where if we have the runtime exception the the transactions are not at all atomic now let's jump on to the databricks notebook where we'll try to uh, see the feature set from the spark 3 preview and to enable the Spark 3 preview on your cluster, you have to enable this property, which is Spark .delta .preview enable as true. If we'll do uh, do it as true, we'll be able to uh, leverage the Spark 3 AVIs and the feature sets. So now the same example which we ran it on the shell, we'll try to run it with the Spark 3. The only difference that we are doing here is the format is the delta. So this is the difference how you like uh, how you write it in the data lake format in the in the data in the delta lake uh, format we'll have to give the format as delta and then you can uh, rest is same we're just calling the save api which will create the parky files for this particular um, integer values from 1 to 100 right so let's run it and let's see what happens let me try to run it So it will create me a parky file with 100 records. Let's check the count. It should be 100. Yes, we've got the 100 count. Now the same program. Now the same program. Here also what we are trying to do, we are trying to run a transaction for uh, 50 integer values from 1 to 50. And we threw a runtime exception in between. Now here, if my transaction would be atomic, the state of the data should be maintained. So at the end of this exception also, I should get my 100 records as is as part of that parky file. So let's run it and see what happens. Okay, so it has thrown the exception. Let's see. Is it the same exception which we are trying to throw or uh, is something else? Okay, so it has thrown the same exception that we threw explicitly. And now let's see what happened to the state of the data. Uh, what What is the count of the data now? It should be 100 if the transaction is atomic. Yes, it is. 
so if we look at here the state of the data is maintained in spite we had the runtime exception or the transaction is broken in between so it has followed that philosophy or atomicity which is all or none right so this kind of this is the feature which is provided by delta lake to support the asset transactions in this part now let's try to look in detail how it works by the way so for that let's try to okay let's try to create some 10 records into as the data format as the delta format and try to create a pocky file out of it and when I when I run this particular command which is to create 10 records what happens in my storage in my distributed storage if you'll see it will create one pocky file it has created in my this asset demo folder that we are trying to write here if you see we have write it into an asset demo folder and what it has done essentially it has created one pocky file right and this parquet file uh, would have this data of 10 records, 10 integer values. But the important thing to look at it is it has created a folder which is delta log. And this is the place where all the commit logs are maintained. If you go inside it, we'll see number of different JSON files on per job basis. So it has created a JSON file. And if you try to read that JSON file, it looks like this. Now, which clearly shows that the number of records is 10. You know, it has created a column as ID, right? But the important thing to look at here is it says this particular this particular element which says add, and this is the name of the parquet file which is created. So it is maintaining a commit log which says uh, it has added a parquet file. And when we'll try to read the data from this particular location in the Spark, it will read this particular JSON file which is the commit log, and then render us the data back. Now let's try to override this uh, particular location, say with uh, five values now. The idea here is we're trying to override this location and let's see how Lake handles it. So if I try to run it, what will happen here is if I go there in my demo folder again, it'll create me one more parquet file. So it has not deleted the earlier version. So if you see, it has created me one more parquet file here, right? But how does it maintain that the previous 10 records, this file should not be read, right? That is maintained through the JSON file that it has. That is a metadata file, right? This is the metadata file created. Let's try to preview it. And if you see here, it has said, add the new parquet file. That is the new parquet file created with the five records now. And it has maintained uh, the transaction saying, remove the earlier parquet file right so it has added that uh, uh, understanding in the commit logs that as part of the override we have to remove the previous uh, data and then we have to add the new data which is in the form of this particular parquet file right let's try to add one more transaction and this time we are trying to add say 15 uh, integer values so the result would be same i'll have i'll have one more parquet value and for that particular transaction, I'll have another JSON file, right? JSON file 2. And if I'll try to preview this JSON file, it again says that add this particular parquet file and remove the previous file. Now, what will happen is when I'll try to read the data from this location now, from this Delta uh, file now, it will read all these JSON files. The system will read all these uh, JSON files and based on the different metadata that has been stored in the JSON file, it will eventually provide me the data file for the uh, eventual data that has to be read. For example, when we did the first transaction, right? When we did the first transaction, one parquet file is added. And in the metadata, it says, add this particular parquet file. This is the first transaction. Then we did, when we did the second run, the second job, did the second transaction, it says, remove this particular file right which is nothing but the previous file which was already there and says add this new file now this new file would have the new data based on the transaction 2 when we run the transaction 3 it did the same thing again it said remove this previous one this previous one which is which was the data state before this transaction and says this is 
the final Paki file that has to be written. Now, when I try to read the data, when I try to read the data from this particular location uh, using the Spark APIs, all the JSON files would be read and based on these different elements like add or remove, it will cut down these files which has to be removed. So this is added and this is removed, so this is gone, right? Then this is added and this is removed, this is gone. So eventually I will only have this data file which will be which will be read back when you try to read the data from this particular location so it will only because as the command is override we only need to have the data which is the final transaction so that is how the commit logs uh, are maintained to preserve the state of the data and this also helps us in terms of doing the time travel to go back and look at the snapshot of the data and that will look into the as as part of the video further right but it maintains all the commit log it maintains the kind of the history log of the entire transactions which kinds of helps us in maintaining the or preserving the state of the data right so guys that's it in this particular video uh, as part of the spark 3 delta lake features in the next video we'll discuss the uh, some of the more features of uh, the spark 3 delta lake things like DML support, upsets and deletes, schema enforcement at the right time or at the ingestion itself and the features of the time travel. So guys that's it in this particular video. Have a great day ahead. Keep learning and do not forget to subscribe to the channel. Have a great day ahead. Bye bye.